Uh, my name is Alejandro Cañete, I'm the director of the Latin American Studies Center, and I'm very pleased to uh, be here to introduce and coordinate the, dis uh, coordinate the discussion of our Jubit's uh, book. This is our last event uh, uh, this year, so it's in a way, it's uh, like the fin de fiesta. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce, uh, uh, for those of you who don't, don't I know her work, I'm going to introduce uh, Judith uh, Frydenberg uh, uh, first. She's going to make a short comment in regard to her book, and then I will introduce each of the three <laughs> commentators who will make brief comments, and then I will uh, open a, a question and answer uh, period. So for all of you to make comments, questions, or whatever. All right, so Judith Frydenberg uh, is joined the Department of Anthropology in 1995 here at the University of Maryland, and she previously held joint appointments at the City University of New York and, and, the, and the, at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Center for Urban Research, where her research on the medical anthropology and community development of a, a neighborhood culminated in the anthropology of low-income urban enclaves, the case of East Harlem which was published in 1995. And also another publication, Growing All in El Barrio, uh, published by New York University Press, uh, uh, which appeared in 2000, the year 2000. It says here forthcoming, but I don't think it is already. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, her interest in reaching community groups, service uh, providers, and policymakers led her to curate a bilingual exhibit of ethnographic and photographic explorations of the Spanish Harlem displayed in New York and Mexico City. Since arriving on campus, she has been affiliated with uh, the Center for Latin American Studies, the Center on, on Aging, the Department of American Studies, and the Department of Women's Studies. Currently, uh, she's researching healthcare and employment needs of Latin American immigrant retirees in Langley Park, very close to campus, where she coordinates the network for Latino research to foster research on social issues affecting local immigrant populations from Latin America. She has also taught as a Fulbright scholar in her hometown, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's like a virtual party to me, um, the birth of a book. Um, so um, I just want to make uh, a few comments uh, to um, share with you why I think I wrote the book. Um, I've always had um, research interest uh, that uh, led me to uh, try to understand uh, the dual role of uh, history and collective memory, particularly elicited through ethnographic methods, um, to understand migration. And uh, also very interested in figuring out how studying at the local level helps understand global um, population movements, uh, how studying immigration at the local level helps uh, understand global population movements. Um, within this uh, focus on locality, I've been very interested in seeing the um, intersection of ethnicity, social class, uh, national origin, and the social construction of alternative versions of the past. And so, um, just to sum it up, uh, for me, the study of immigration provides uh, a very good entry to um, understand or reflect um, discourses of nation and, and try to understand um, um, various interpretations of what that nation uh, means. Um, so um, here I was uh, thinking of uh, all of these interests and where would be a good place for me to go um, during an upcoming semester sabbatical. And I accompanied my mother on a tour, a uh, cultural tourism tour, mm -hmm. uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to take um, tourists, um, visitors, to the center of the province of Entre Rios to understand what was left of the uh, agrarian colonization program that had brought um, uh, many uh, Eastern European Jews uh, to um, rural Argentina. 
And so we thought of this as a nice trip to take together. And uh, she kept talking during the trip about um, how in one of the sites that we were going to visit, San Gregorio, uh, there would be no doubt that we would distinguish uh, her grandparents' home because the house looked like this and like that, and it was surrounded by trees and so on. And uh, just to make a long story short, uh, she was born in the province of Entre Rios, where this house was, but um, when we got to this site, there was nothing. And this uh, happened almost uh, no evidence of a house, no evidence of the trees. And this happened in many other sites that we visited during that tour. So I got very um, interested in figuring out um, how the memories of the past are memories, uh, reconstruct the past, but are not validated by the present and um, how um, to, to I, I started thinking about this um, um, choosing of one of the places that we were taken to in this uh, tour as a field site to spend the semester there. And I ended up choosing Villa Clara, which uh, was because it was relatively small, about 3,500 inhabitants then, and also because it's different from the other sites in the tour, it had uh, a wide diversity of social class, ethnicity, national origin, um, national origin of grandparents because there were descendants of immigrants from Eastern Europe and from Western Europe. Um, moreover, um, during our visits there, I understood how I, I could see, I could sense how people had a very good um, hold on their own history at the time of our visit. Uh, they were planning for the first centennial of the village and uh, everybody was organizing and uh, interested in figuring out what they would display in this, in this performance. So I decided to reconstruct the history of the village by living there for um, a semester and trying to understand how the villagers themselves understood the history of the village. Um, link that together with um, archival um, uh, um, uh, information and also um, you know, whatever I could grab. Uh, people were suspicious of uh, me and the two students that went with me at first. Uh, one descendant of uh, German immigrants uh, thought we, were, we had been sent, because we were coming from the United States, we had been sent by the CIA. <laughs> uh, other people kept saying, why us? You know, why, why would you be interested in this remote village? Uh, who cares? And, but eventually, by living there, um, I, I made friends. I, I got my, my um, stakes in the same place than everybody else. And so they were interested in, um, in, in having a book written, but they were not very sure that they were aligned with me in the kind of scholarly book that I had to promise um, the powers that be here uh, for a sabbatical semester. To produce. So what I ended up doing um, is this book, Memorias de Villa Clara, in Spanish, um, which had this heavily in, um, illustrated, and which was a way to help um, the um, reopened museum in the village to um, tell its stories and, and help them to get funding, because um, uh, during my stay there, the mayor approached me to help train docents for the museum, and I could see that they had no funding, and so I thought, well, how about telling the story of the village first with lots of pictures, uh, putting together everybody's interpretation of the history, <coughs> and selling this together with uh, pictures of the material culture in the museum as a way to raise funding. And this is still being sold um, there and uh, at the museum uh, and brings money. And uh, then some other people um, asked about the other book and that took me into writing um, this book in English and thanks to a very um, good Argentine historian and, um, and collaborator 
uh, this year at Marconi, I could uh, collaborate in the translation of the book that appeared a few months ago, and that thanks to our um, uh, panelists, uh, we're going to hear about. So thanks, Kate, for taking this invitation. All right, so um, uh, the first uh, commentator is gonna be uh, Laura De Maria. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Spanish department and uh, she received uh, her undergraduate degree at the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba in Argentina and her PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. Her uh, research, research explored the complex ways in which the 19th century is reinscribed in contemporary Southern Cone literature and concentrates primarily in Argentina. She has published articles on 19th and 20th century Latin American literatures in, uh, and she in refereed journals, and she's also the author of Argentina's Ricardo Piglia Dialoga con la Generación del 37 en la Discontinuidad, uh, published in Buenos Aires in 1999, and Cruces de Carlota, uh, Córdoba 2008, a collection of short stories. Her current book, Buenos Aires y las Provincias, Relatos para Desarmar, will be published this year. In, by Beatriz Viterbo, editora in Argentina. Love. Thank you so much. Well, I would like to thank today for letting me read Misha um, Clara, because I come from an also small town in the middle of La Pampa, La Carlota, and when I was reading your, your book, I felt completely identified with that small town and the stories that, that circulate and all the guiding fictions that the different um, people in, in the town uh, can can um, talk about. But um, I would like to start um, with the title. And um, I'm not a historian. I should say that I'm not a historian. I'm, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not an ethnographic uh, reader. But I am a literary person. I am uh, somebody that does cultural studies. And uh, I would like to uh, Start quoting Austin, who has a, a brilliant book that it says, How to Do Things with Words. And what I would like to propose, the reading that I would like to propose of to this book is how to do things with books. Um, and in a way, um, I'm now going to summarize her book. I will invite you to read it because it's, it's a wonderful uh, introduction to uh, something that is not Buenos Aires. And uh, so besides that, what I would like to talk about a little bit is like different points. My first point is the title, the concept of invention. And um, this is not the only book that, uh, ref that has been titled lately as invention. We have Nicola Shamwe, The Invention of Argentina, Federico Neiburg, The Invention of Peronism, uh, Dario Mancori, Salsa Touch, La Invención del Peronismo en el Interior del País. And each one of them, and also the invention of the Jewish gauchos, uh, inscribe a crossroad and, it, and a deep relationship between the process of narration and the construction of an identity. The process of uh, narrating, constructing text, even oral texts, and the, the process of inventing a culture. And, or to say it in a different way, the process of inventing is a process of narrating. Or in order to invade, invent, we need to narrate. And when you open this book, uh, what you find is that you're gonna find uh, a multiplicity of voices, of stories, uh, and that's what I would like to stress. The, the amount of different perspective and the myriad of voices that Judith and the descendants and the historians and um, the majors and, and, and the archive uh, covers a body um, and you can, you can even touch the voices. Uh, you can even construct an, a road between the different stories. And that road between the different stories is basically what constructs the identity, what constructs Filia Clara, what goes from the origins to today. So that would be my first uh, big point. 
um, the invention. My second point is the construction of contact zones. And there are a variety of contact zones that I, that I saw described in this book. The first one is the methodology. Um, this is a text that is constructed by a multidisciplinary perspective and you can find history, you can find an ethnographic report, the interviews, you have the field work, you have the informants, the ethnographic, the local history, the newspaper, the manuscript, the personal memories, the Latin history. And all of this is what constructs and invents the story of Isabella. And I don't think that it would be possible to construct the complexity of Visa Clara without the complexity of all the disciplines that help uh, truly recreate these space. The second mm, context zone is Visa Clara as a metaphor of Argentina. Um, Visa Clara uh, is a small town um, in the middle of Entre Rios, um, a province away from Buenos Aires and decide but because of that it's a perfect place to start reading the history of Argentina um, the process of modernity and the, with the construction of the country as a possibility as an utopian place and the reality of that history and at the same time how that um, the narrative of progress, the narrative of um, dreams got squished and went into a process of decadence. You, if you're not fairness, you will see the decadence, right? <laughs> well, um, so, and Visa Clara has that, that centrality that in a way moves beyond Buenos Aires as the center of how to narrate Argentinian uh, identity. And that gesture of um, desviar the Argentinian identity from Buenos Aires to the countryside, to, um, if you want to call a marginal um, town, for me is precisely what gives this, uh, this text, um, the capacity of showing another way of writing or, or constructing or inventing the national identity. And I'm not going to um, deal with all the colonias and the process of the, the, the how Colonia Clara uh, went, became a town, Visa Clara, and how the town became the, the cultural tourism place. Where, uh, she, where she went, because I'm, I'm sure that some of you will, will touch. Um, but then the third contact zone that I would like to address is the concept of the Jewish gaucho. Um, and the Jewish gaucho is the, it's a hybrid and it's a, the perfect um, place to show how transculturation takes place not only in Argentina, but also in, the, in different place, uh, places. And it would be, a common place for me would be to go to Harchuno and start reading um, Judith in relation to Harchuno, um, La Gaucho Judíos. Uh, and, and she does that. And I'm not going to go into that into that reading, uh, because there are two specialists of Hartunov in the room, and I don't feel comfortable talking about Hartunov. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the gaucho judíos and use what uh, this this multiplicity of issues of, that are inside here in order to create. Um, or do something with the, this book, or create a new invention with this book, and is um, to establish a, re a relationship between the inventions of the Jewish gaucho and La Ciudad Ausente de Ricardo Piglia. And why do I say that there's a, co uh, there's a close relationship between these two texts? 
because what I want to embed, or how I want to visualize uh, Judith in Villa Clara is as Junior in La Ciudad Ausente. This detective, this narrator that travels and walks through the town and by walking narrates the city and by walking she narrates the town and by walking she encounters the voices and she encounters the museum. In both texts, at the center, there is a museum. In the Recalopedia, inside the museum, there's a machine that narrates voices, that multiplies the voices. And those voices re-narrate or reinvent the story of Argentina. And in Villa Clara, what, El, what uh, Judith does is to become Elena. Elena is the name of uh, the machine in La Ciudad Center. And I imagine uh, Judith slash Elena as this, as this machine that propagates the voices that are there, that are circulating, that are uh, um, constructing stories vis-a-vis -vis the official story that, that the museum tries to um, tries to uh, produce, and Judith, in more, in more than one occasion, said that the museum, in a way, constructs a limited and a reduced version of the plurality of the complexity of that migrant sub subject. And in order to uh, incorporate this complexity and this plurality, she needed to talk to the descendants. So in a way, Visha Clara becomes the museum, not because Visha Clara has a museum, but because of the voices, the live voices, and the colectividades that practice their culture every single day, invent new traditions and invent new stories. So as I said, the invention is the narrative, and the narrative is the inventions. And in this way, the stories of the Jewish culture does not belong to the past, but it's an articulation that we constantly articulate and re-narrate and rewrite and rethink in the present. So my invention is to see Judy as Elena writing and propagating the stories of a small town that lets us think against the grave, the construction of Argentina. And that's all. Thank you, Laura. The next commentator is uh, uh, Patricio Kosienevich. Uh, he uh, who came to the University of Maryland in 1993 and now currently is professor and chair of the Department of Sociology. Uh, he is a comparative and historical sociologist. In one and, and in one line of research, uh, uh, he studies uh, different dimensions of global inequality, for example, between countries, within countries, and between men and women. Uh, and a second line of research focuses on social movements, particularly in Latin America. Using a world systems approach, uh, his recent work has examined the interaction between globalization, inequality, and structural adjustment policies, as well as patterns of response and participation by civil society uh, to free trade agreements in the Americas. So his uh, latest book uh, is uh, called Unveiling Inequality, a World Historical Perspective, and was published uh, in 2009. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank Alejandro and Latin American Studies and Judith for the opportunity of uh, making a few comments about this great book. Uh, I recommend that all to read it. Uh, I, it's, it's seldom uh, that I think in Argentina one encounters uh, very serious studies about the uh, uh, interior, or at least there's a lack of serious studies about the policies of interior. And I think that this is a great contribution. So I encourage you. Read the book. I was struggling trying to figure out exactly what to do in the time allotted, so I also have three points uh, to go over. Um, I once had a professor 
people told me they always have to come three points <laughs> in any presentation. And they, I asked them why, I said, because two is too new and four is too much. <laughs> so the first point, I mean, it, it, so I have these three points, and, and, and with each of these points, I end with a question for further discussion with, with Judith. Uh, so the first uh, area is on the issue of construction of identities. I think that the book is uh, very productive in exploring how memory is shaped by a tension between an official story and what Judith calls, uh, and here I quote from the book, a latent history based on memory and disseminated orally, rarely written, or accounted for in private documents. Uh, and it's these sources, this latent history, that uh, Judith has been able to tap with her very careful ethnographic research. Uh, for example, what is the meaning of some of these ethnic categories like the Ojo and how they have changed over time? And it, it, it's complex enough to try to reconstruct the changing meaning of these terms in official documents is much more complex when one tries to uncover uh, this hidden dimension that, that Judith focuses on in the book. Um, so again, these identities are extremely complex, but Judith's books suggest that this complexity can be drawn out by tapping into what I think James Scott would call uh, the hidden, hidden transcripts. Exploring this complexity is important because this, uh, what Judith calls the social memory, is intertwined with social hierarchies and power. And uh, exploring the social memory can give us insights not only into the characteristics of these hierarchies and, and, and the organization of power, but also the discourses and cultural representations that serve to either legitimate those structures, those, those uh, social hierarchies, or even to challenge those social hierarchies on the, in some instances. Uh, so regarding this point, I hope that maybe Judith can tell us a little bit more about the process through which she gained the level of trust that is required in order to gain access to these hidden transcripts. As you were mentioning before, people often do not share these uh, willingly, and they, these, these hidden transcripts are often also very conflictual in their alternative interpretation of official stories. So uh, I think it would be interesting if you could expand a little bit on that point. Uh, the second issue is the way in which the book deals with cycles of innovation and collapse, or boom and bust. Uh, I, 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 my, my own work focuses quite a bit on this notion of cycles, and I, I use the Joseph Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction quite a bit to characterize the nature of these cycles. So what I find very striking in the book is that in the social memory that is reconstructed by Judith, identities are clearly linked to these cycles. No? Uh, the, 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 the cycle of uh, expansion in the late, uh, eight, late 19th century, early 20th century, was accompanied by, by one set of cultural identities, and uh, there is a very thorough transformation of these identities with the collapse of the, or, or at least the stagnation of this economy in the late, latter part. So there are many metaphors in the book that deal with this notion of cycles. Uh, clearly, the Jaclara itself goes through such a cycle. There's a very rapid economic expansion centered around agriculture in the late 19th century and early 20th century. But then, as I said before, there's this economic stagnation that sets in uh, in the late 20th century. Uh, this, this, this cycle is also evident in the trajectory of the railroad. Right, the, the, the arrival of the railroad in the late 19th century, early 20th century, coincides with an initial cycle of economic expansion and actually facilitated that cycle of economic expansion because it linked 
the La Clara Tomorrow Market, uh, and then uh, later in the 20th century, the closing down of the railroad is fully associated and further deepens the economic stagnation of, of Villa Clara. And it's clear that uh, one doesn't need to know much about Argentina in order to know that these cycles that she describes for Villa Clara are representative of broader uh, national processes. Woman past. But the book also shows that the cycle of boom and bust has very unequal impacts on different social groups. Uh, for example, the migrants of the late 19th and early 20th century that uh, much of the book focuses on clearly benefited from the expansion of the 20th century, but many of these initial migrants, or at least their descendants, leave Villa Clara before the economic stagnation sets in. And it's a very a very different group, or, or it's very different social groups that are most affected by the crisis of the late 20th century. Uh, I think the, 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 again, the book is very productive in showing the many different ways in which the social memory reconstructs these events. And, and for example, the images of ethnicity are often mobilized either to legitimate the success of one group or to explain away uh, the failure of other groups to reach the same uh, standards of, 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 of economic mobility or social mobility and so forth. Uh, but, but these arguments can be difficult to take, I imagine, in, in Villa Clara itself. So I'm, I, I think it would be interesting if you could talk a little bit about what the reception of the book was, if particularly in regards to the many ways in which your account of, of uh, these uh, contending identities uh, contradicts the official history of Villa Clara. Uh, and then the final point is about civil society. Civil society in the book appears to follow parallel trajectories to the economic cycles of boom and bust. The book shows uh, very clearly the importance of civil society uh, during this period of uh, the expansion of markets in the late 19th century, most obviously with the Jewish Colonization Association, which played a very crucial role in facilitating migration to Entre Rios uh, beginning in the late 19th century, but also uh, your account of Villa Clara is full of these examples of this thriving civil society with Sociedad de Fomento and Cooperativas and houses of worship and community centers, social clubs, and so forth. And I think uh, this is a striking characteristic of Argentina as a whole, that in many instances, the very explosive expansion of markets in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was accompanied by a, a at least in relative terms, an absence of the state and a much greater presence alongside with the market of civil society. You know? uh, and and, and uh, the, the book seems to insinuate that it, it doesn't tackle this issue directly, but there seems to be uh, also a, a somewhat of a collapse of those civil society organizations in the late 20th century, uh, which would fit sort of the broader economic collapse. And, and, and perhaps here you could talk a little bit more of what is the shape of civil society in Villa Clara today, no? particularly from a historical perspective. And, uh, but like I said, uh, this is a great book, and, 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 and uh, I learned a lot, not just about Villa Clara, but how to think about these broader processes of migration and social mobility. And so thank you. The final commentator is uh, Marcia Rosenblit, uh, who is the Harvey Meyerhoff uh, Professor of Modern Jewish History. And she, Marcia, is a social historian of uh, Jews in Central Europe. She is the author of the Jews of uh, Vienna, 1867-1914, uh, Assimilation and Identity, published in 1983, and Reconstructing the National Identity, the Jews of Habsburg, Austria, during World War, uh, published in 2001. Uh, in addition, she has co-edited uh, Constructing Nationalities in East Central Europe, published in 2005, and published over 30 uh, scholarly articles on such uh, topics as Jewish uh, religious reform in 19th century Vienna, 
synagogue affiliation in 19th century Baltimore and Austrian Jewish women during World War I. Uh, she is currently completing work on Jews and other uh, Germans in Moravia, 1848-1938. She has served as the president of the Association for Jewish Studies between 2009 and 2011. Uh, is vice president for program uh, and as a, as treasurer of the American Academy for Jewish research, uh, in which, in which uh, you were, those who were all associated with the Association, Association for Jewish History, Studies. Um, uh, Professor uh, Rosenblatt has been at the University of Maryland since uh, 1978, serving as the director of the Meyerhoff Center for Jewish Studies uh, from 1998 to 2003, and currently she is the director of graduate studies in the History Department. In Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I am a historian, so I'm um, not a social scientist like uh, Judith and uh, Patrizio or a literary scholar. So I'm going to talk about history. Um, and uh, be but before I do, let me just talk, just address the issue of three points. The reason that people do three points is because three. I'm, I'm, I'm a historian, not an anthropologist, but three is a magic number in Western <laughs> civilization because of the Trinity. Uh, and therefore, the Trinity is because three is a magic number, it's probably both ways, in any case. Um, but that's irrelevant for uh, Jewish gauchos, uh, or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, I am a historian, and I have to begin by saying, well, I've, I've also very much enjoyed this book, and the very little role that Jewish studies played in this book, we gave Judith money to get, her, get a recorder, right? A fancy tape recorder or something. Um, but, um, uh, the book is, is a wonderfully interesting book, which explores all sorts of, of issues that I explore as a historian and other historians explore, but from the point of view of an ethnographer and, and anthropologist, and so it's wonderful. Um, but the cent one of the central issues in Jewish history, that is in the history of the Jews, is the, the, uh, the issue of identity. Um, we didn't need fancy new scholars to discover this. This was something that we were interested in for a long time, and what does it mean um, to be Jewish, but also what does it mean to become something else while still staying Jewish? So what does it mean to become Argentinian, in this case, while still being Jewish? And that's sort of the central issue in modern Jewish history in the eight, from the 18th century. Right? How do Jews assimilate, adopt the, the mores and identities of the world in which they live and uh, the culture and languages of their neighbors and still remain Jewish. And so this is a, a, an important contribution to that literature because um, what Judy's done is taken a look at a very unusual group of Jews who go to a rural area um, in the middle of absolutely no place from the Jewish point of view, like Buenos Aires is not in the middle of absolutely no place, but, the, but, uh, but this, little, this little town. Um, uh, certainly is. Um, they're not the only Jewish farmers in the world in this period. There is some attempt in the late 19th century to have Jews become farmers. They had been long prohibited from farming, and uh, they were now allowed to farm, but um, uh, most of the land in Europe was already you know, owned by somebody else. So they, uh, there were attempts both in, in, in Argentina, and in, in North America, in, um, and of course in Palestine, and, and what is today Israel. That was the most successful of the three attempts, obviously, but the, um, but actually in all three cases, ultimately everybody leaves the land and goes to the big city. Um, uh, there's a wonderful memoir by a, uh, a Jewish woman who was a homesteader in South Dakota in the, in the 1880s, a woman whose name escapes me right now, but um, uh, you know, she and her husband homesteaded in South Dakota, and it was hard, and it was difficult, and they were there. And they managed, like many other homesteaders, first they lived in the dirt, and then they built a nice house, and they, everything was wonderful, and by the 1890s they were successful. And then they moved to Minneapolis and opened a grocery store. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, because who wants to be a farmer? <laughs> you know, I suppose, I don't know. But in any case, um, so this is part of a larger, um, uh, uh, of a large, actually they moved probably because they wanted their children to marry Jews and there were Jews in Minneapolis and there weren't in South Dakota. So, in any case, um, uh, but I, I, I admired this, this attempt to try to understand um, 
what that was like in one particular place and exploring what Argentinian, and use it to explore larger issues of Argentinian identity um, uh, as well. Um, but I too have some questions about it, um, uh, having made that, I don't have three points, you may notice, I just have one big point. But um, the, 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 the issue is, um, what was the, the relation, I mean, there are several issues that I, I have as questions. What was their relationship with other Argentinian Jews, right? Because after all, there was a large Jewish community in Buenos Aires that was developing in this period. They too were confronting what it meant to be Argentinian and what it meant to be Jewish in this very uh, different environment than, than the environment of Eastern Europe. They too had to um, you know, become Argentine. And, and what did that mean? Um, what did it mean for, the, I mean, not what did it mean for the Jews in Buenos Aires, that's been studied. What, what, what is the relationship between um, these Jews uh, or these people in, in um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce Villa in the Spanish way. I know several languages, but Spanish is not. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say Villa Clara. Um, Vija, is that how you said it? Vija? Okay, Vija Clara. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say um, Villa Clara. Um, you know, what um, you know? What is the connection? Not the conne literal connection, but what is the relationship between these Jews and uh, and other Jews? Um, and and then I suppose I have other questions that occur to me as both of you were talking. I mean, how do um, how do you, how do what were the difficulties of adopting an Argentine identity? Not in Buenos Aires here, you know. Um, surrounded by a rural environment, which is very Catholic, and um, and so forth. So um, I, you know, I, I just want to focus on the the Jewishness of, of these people, or at least of the original settlers. I mean, I, by now, I suppose they're not Jewish, but um, and uh, so I, I was wondering if you could say something um, say something about about those two issues. That's all I have to say, actually. I really enjoyed uh, an anthropological excursion into some of the same issues that I deal with as a historian. And uh, I'm very Thank you, Marcia. And uh, I'll give you an opportunity to, use it to answer some of the questions if you want to, and then I will open the floor to for questions and comments. Sure. Um, um, I thank all of you. I've learned a lot today. It's uh, it's um, uh, really makes me think. But many other things. Definitely not writing another book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I keep thinking about the topic as we all do when when we write something. And I keep visiting Vijay Clara, and more thoughts come to mind. Um, um, I haven't researched what the relationship um, of uh, Jews who lived in Vijayvara was um, um, with the Jews in Buenos Aires, except um, for for doing this um, this writing that um, I consulted with the um, the archives of the uh, Jewish uh, Colonization Association. Um, which I found in New York, and uh, and most of the correspondence was in French, and it was amazing how little connection there was um, with between the administrators in Paris and in London and the administrators of the Jewish Colonization Organization in Buenos Aires and those that were really the, the, the farmers and the people fighting with um, you know, the locusts and the fires and everything on the ground. Um, um, the, these archives, this correspondence paints a very rosy picture of uh, what the life was on the ground and actually doesn't pay much attention to what I heard and, and read from uh, the minutes of the organization's um, 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 meetings about what they struggled with day by day. Um, I did hear in my interviews how they had relatives in Buenos Aires and other large cities. Um, mostly they had relatives in, the, in other large cities in the province of Entre Rios because they typically moved um, not everybody moved directly to Buenos Aires. A lot of people moved to towns in the same province, in the same state. 
um, for example, Basalipaso, Concordia, etc. And so they they started, you know, um, uh, extending the families and many different. So they got together for weddings and and all kinds of um, of events. Um, so visiting uh, relatives. Another another thing that you mentioned: how do they maintain a Jewish identity? Well, because of the historical conditions of exclusion of being Jews Jew in Europe. Um, they did um, use um, religion and prayer uh, as a great socializer and equalizer. And so um, as the Jewish Colonization Association um, provided for the construction of the houses, they also provided for the construction of a school and a synagogue. So that was not only a place of prayer, but also the community center. Uh, you know, the place where a lot of social activities took place. So, uh, but more to come, and if you come up with that memoir, uh, oh, memoir I that memoir, I would, I would love to, to read it. And um, um, I keep thinking about your, uh, your thoughts, and, uh, and I, yes, I read uh, La Ciudad Ausente, and I think it's, I'll reread it because you know, it about uh, a number of things. I think that the issues are, um, you know, uh, I focus on these issues in this particular <coughs> locality, but right now I'm working on a book on the immigrant experience in Prince George's County, and I come up with the same issues of transculturations, we might call it transnationalism uh, nowadays, but it's, it's the same, um, um, preoccupation about amalgamating several identities and still finding meaning um, in, in the life that you put together. Um, the issue of trust, um, I, uh, which is um, something that um, you know plagues ethnographers because you know it plagues every social relationship, right? Um, to what extent you can establish trust, um, how quickly, uh, how much trust are you going to get so that you get to, um, to, to what, you're, what you're trying to get to. My, my, um, my way of dealing with this was to first live continuously in the village for four months. And then uh, once I decided I was going to do Memorias de Villa Clara, to come back and uh, do repeat visits um, where, well, even when I was living there for four months, um, when, when I realized that there were issues of trust, like, well, we agents, you know, from the extreme of, well, we agents of the CIA to what are these people doing here and how much should we talk to them? Um, so I put together, um, you know, a sort of an open invitation uh, I invited everybody in the village to come to celebrate the birthday of uh, Senora or Senor Villa Clara. Because they were preparing for the centennial, so I thought, you know, let's all prepare for the centennial. Who is this person? What is Villa Clara? How do we remember Villa Clara? And I, um, there was a very good attendance. Um, it was in the villages auditorium and, and then I divided the, the, um, the audience into um, age groups and it was amazing what, uh, how differently uh, the memories came up and how different uh, facts were, were memorialized. For example, the railroad has an incredible, you know, it's the soul of the town. Uh, it's, uh, even, even if it's, there's only an occasional cargo train, well, there's a passenger train, but you have to uh, communicate by cell phone with, <laughs> with uh, the train to see at what time it might pass the village and then make sure that you're there to, to, uh, to get on the train so it's not very reliable. But, you know, the older people, for example, um, as one of the images that they had about uh, Villa Clara was the, the train and the train station. And the fact that they all went to the train station because 
when the train was coming because it was a social activity, it was a place to eye people, to perhaps meet with your future spouse. And uh, the children said, there is a railroad, it has only one rail, period. So, you know, it was like two different constructions um, of what the railroad meant for the village. Um, when, when I decided to, to do Memorias de Villa Clara, I went twice um, uh, back to, for several weeks. One, to, um, to tell them about what I was about to do and to ask everybody who had photographs or documents to come and uh, I put a portable scanner and um, it was all scanned uh, for photo review. And then um, when I went to present in, in the same auditorium, Memoria Sevilla Clara, um, I did have uh, people, you know, everybody knows everybody and there's gossip in every corner, but there were many people who didn't accept uh, some of the versions that I wrote uh, out. And I still remember uh, a woman who stood like this, stood up and went like this and said, who told you that? <laughs> about whatever it was, you know, that I was saying, um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't true. Because, um, you know, there, there, there was and there's still <coughs> controversy in the town about uh, the official s the story of the first Jewish settlers who maintained, and still today, say, there was nothing here. We did it all. We put together the organizations. We made sure that um, that um, uh, our children went to school, et cetera, et cetera. And it was true that they came with all of that because they came, a lot of them, as educated people. But then there's the um, native of Argentina's version that says, well, maybe we didn't have a town, but we lived here, and uh, we had a, uh, you know, we had a life, and, uh, and it was right here, my grandparents lived right here. So, you know, how you reconcile those two versions, and uh, to me, is a way of also understanding the construction of the nation. Um, and, uh, and it's very complex. Uh, questions, comments? Mary? I really enjoyed the panel, so thank you, everybody. Um, Judith, I haven't read Memorias de Vigia Clara, um, and I'm curious about the role of the museum in the town, and um, what, what it depicted, um, and whether there was any change as a result of the work that you did, and what kind of relationship you had with the people who put together the museum. I didn't have um, a chance to be there when the museum opened. Uh, it was before I came but uh, there were sort of lay historians of uh, the uh, Jewish experience um, in the town who, left, who, who literally scribbled in pieces of paper a history of the town, uh, then started collecting artifacts. And that's the way the museum was, uh, was born. Um, actually, at the time um, uh, when the railroad was um, was privatized and there was uh, very limited service, they got permission to have um, the, the railroad station as a museum. And it still is at the railroad <laughs> station um, because you know, there's almost no movement there except with cargo trains. And um, it closed for a while after one of these uh, lay historians died. And uh, then the school teachers um, reopened it, and uh, with a project for school children, which also send them to uh, tap on people's doors and ask for artifacts. And the um, most of the artifacts were donated by descendants of the first Jewish settlers. So the way the 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 um, major exhibition space was set up was to tell that story. Um, and
and uh, later when the descendants of the other European immigrations uh, started participating and wanted to have their voice heard in the, um, the planning of the centennial, uh, they were given some space, but not all the space. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty much um, the history of the, of the Jews in the area. And some of the institutional history, for example, those, um, you know, the, the first um, uh, dental chair, <laughs> the medical, uh, medical artifacts, and, and there is a tiny, not only is there a tiny space for the gauchos, the natives of the land, the hybrids, na natives of the land, but uh, also I found it interesting that it also, uh, the space is called Rincon Gaucheco, the corner of the gauchos. So it's not only small, it's a corner. <laughs> so I, I find that very interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Because um, I think we idealize um, gauchos from our youth and reading books and interesting things, how exciting it all is. And then for them, it was just a reality. Were there really Jewish gauchos? Oh, um, to what yeah, extent? Think, well, to what extent? You know, of course, um, one of the experts in the Gertrude office here, and maybe he can tell us, he can tackle that question first, and then I'll follow. That's a nice word of question. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I've learned like the three questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were. Were, uh, Borges said that they were not gauchos, they were chacareros, mm. sort of like farmhands. But yes, they were. And they, and they faced the, some of the issues that you tackled in the book and that Laura was addressing and you mentioned before, that it has to do with how you integrate into the land and how do you assume the role of the farmhand. What is even more interesting is the fact that there were non-Jewish gauchos who connected with the community by speaking English. Oh! Wow. Uh, and, uh, He's talking to a Sephardic person. <laughs> well, nobody's perfect. Anyway, uh, I know. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's quite a... It was a connection. Well, there was definitely a connection, definitely. I mean, that classic book, The Jewish Gauchos, which is not such a great book, except that it was the first to deal with that, and it was written for the centennial in 1910. Uh, does address that aspect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, there are some movies about that. Uh, in fact, they made a terrible movie of that book. Yeah. Uh, but in a addition musical. to that, uh, it's a sort of musical too. The movie based on the Jewish yeah. culture, it's a terrible movie. It's Don't a terrible movie. It. But, there is a, but there is a so the documentary with some of the descendants mm. and that ends with a Jewish guy dressed up like a gaucho and he says, gaucho por Dios, soy yo, that's me. Uh, so yes, you do have, there is such a thing. Romanticized, yeah, like everything with the settlers. And one of the interesting things that you were alluding to is there was a Ica based community in New Jersey yes. that faced exactly the same problems the as the Jews were there. Well, yeah. many, there were yeah, many yeah. 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 And also in Australia, so you can do Argentina, Australia, New right. Jersey in a comparative basis. Actually, yeah. that's right. I mean, one would want to, you know, I mean, an historian might look at the, yeah. you know, comparing all of these agricultural communities as well as the connection to the, I mean, this is a period of Jewish migration after all. Two and a half million Jews left the Russian well, left Eastern Europe in, between 1880 and 1924. That's a lot of people. And, and while most of them came to the United States, two million came to the United States. But still, a lot of people went other places as well. So um, it's part of the world. You know, what's interesting is you ask how do they become Argentine, but you never ask how do they become German or Polish or Austrian. Yes, we ask it all the time. And, uh, but I mean, in this context, it's like it's more exotic to become Argentine than to become something else. Um, you know, I don't know if that's true because I explore how Jews became German, and that, yeah. you know, in my work. So um, they don't. They do, and <laughs> right, and, right. I mean, both are true. Yeah. Uh, 
a quick question. Could you uh, quickly, because I know a lot of people already know that, um, touch on how those communities came to exist historically? I, from what I understand, it was the Rothschilds or whoever who bought land and just got the people in. And could you just quickly tell us a little bit? Yeah, and that was exactly it. Um, uh, there was a uh, um, wealthy uh, philanthropist, uh, Byron de Hirsch, that um, was um, um, able to um, to buy large uh, large tracts of land in Argentina at a time when the Argentine government wanted to uh, bring um, Europeans, particularly white Europeans, um, and it was not as um, you know as um, Immigration was not as closed as it was later on, and this was in the 1890s. And uh, they, he bought uh, large tracts of lands, and um, primarily in the province of Entre Rios, but also in other provinces, there were there was a 1.40 colonies, agricultural colonies, um, throughout Argentina. And how many survived? About. Well, I mean, the, the, let's put it this way. The places, localities are still there, and uh, you can visit some preserved um, uh, localities through these cultural tours. Um, nobody still lives in the colonies. Um, I mean, there's, you know, they're part of villages and towns, and you know, um, uh, some people who bought the land because they had 20 years to pay for the land. Some people who bought the land, um, you know, if they only had one tract of land, it was unproductive, so they ended up selling and moving elsewhere. Uh, some um, profited from the situation, stayed on, and bought off those that were leaving and became landowners themselves. So that's that. Those are very, very few. Uh, the Jewish colonization organization started in 1892 and. Uh, ended in 1974, so it's not, it's pretty recent yeah. that, and, and the land that they still had, for example in Villa Clara, um, they donated to the village hmm. for public purposes, so it's not that they sold the land, they donated. Uh, I would like to ask you some things to, to put in context uh, the work on Villa Clara with your, your current work. And I would like to you mention that in passing, but I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on in which ways, uh, if any, did the, the experience of writing the book on Villa Clara help you uh, with your current research on Latino, Latin American immigrants in the, in the area? Uh, is, can you make any, you, you, you mentioned that you Sure. There are some connections. When I took the position um, here in 95, I was um, primarily interested in the Latin American, Latino migration, because that's primarily what I had been doing in New York, my, my previous um, uh, job site. And, uh, but very soon after coming here, I realized um, the richness of the county in terms of the diversity. So I'm no longer only focusing on the Latin American migration, but on migration from all over the world, um, whether they actually reside um, in the county or they just work in the county. And so I'm writing a book about the immigrant experience in the county, uh, trying to understand, um, uh, using the same methodology of life histories, trying to understand who comes here from where and why, um, how they settle here, how they make a life here, and they, whether they become or to what extent they become American and trying to test um, our uh, imagined notions about assimilation and contest them to the, to the extent that they can work or whether it's the way we tend to think. Or ideas as American dream, assimilation, and so on. From the trying to rethink about those issues, but from the perspective of the way that people talk to me. 
And did you find any significant differences between the Jewish experience in Argentina and the Latin American experience in the United States? Well, there are obviously Other differences. Other than the historical differences? From, yeah, and they come from for different reasons. Um, um, some escaping uh, violence uh, in the countries of origin, some because they're, they want uh, to try new opportunities. Uh, another issue that I find uh, interesting in Prince George's County is the wide diversity and socioeconomic um, background of the immigrants, uh, which um, is, is, uh, is uh, contradictory with the idea, uh, the way that the, the outsiders imagine the county and immigration in the county. Thank you very much, Judith. I have a quick question. I'm fascinated about the this te uh, tension that has been talked about um, within the community in terms of the, the varying ways in which they remember the past. Did you see generational tensions? Was youth versus age at all uh, at, at play here? Absolutely. Okay. And actually, um, I didn't only go to ethnographic mm -hmm. interviews in depth from the start. I started doing informal ethnographic interviews first. And <laughs> these focus groups and, and group presentations. And then I, uh, I realized that a lot of the, I was going through a map, by a map that I was given by the mayor of the village, and I realized that a lot of people live well outside of the boundary. Mm -hmm. So I started, um, I did a survey, generational survey, um, going until, you know, there was just open land. Uh, to figure out who lived where and who were those people and when they had arrived. And what I did was uh, what I called a generational survey. I asked them where they were born and where their parents and grandparents were born and if their children, if they had children, where they, they were born. And so um, it gave depth of memory but also of um, living in the village, uh, how long they had lived. And then for um, more structured, um, deep interviews, ethnographic interviews, I selected the oldest person in each block uh, on the basis that they would have the more lengthy memories. Mm -hmm. So that was one way that I tried to, to get at this. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, then I would like to uh, thank the participants in the panel and Judith for the presentations and now invite you all to lunch that will be served across the hallway. The next so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.